Hello everyone, it's Dmitry Anoshin and Surfalytic. This is our model two and today our lesson six, uh, model two about databases. And today we'll talk about NoSQL database. And also I want to talk a bit about NoSQL use cases for data analyst or data engineer and analytics engineer. So some people might think like, oh no, we, we just barely learn relational database in SQL and should we learn NoSQL database? And so I want to help you to answer those questions. And also I want to go through some of the use cases. And so hopefully this, this uh, will help you to better understand use case and have better allocate your time for learning and preparing. So first of all, I want to go through this little diagram. Let's just talk uh, through NoSQL database use cases. And we already covered it in the model two in the, in another lesson different types of uh, database. There is a relational database and there are a bunch of uh, NoSQL database like uh, document, graph, uh, and so on. So we, today we will talk about particular MongoDB because it's very popular uh, database. It can run in the cloud. It can raise the managed version, there is uh, on-premise version, there is open source version, and it's quite popular product for many applications. So let's look to our diagram. Uh, you should be already aware about uh, use cases uh, related to data warehouse, data platform, data lake, lake house. And we definitely will learn different tools and technology related to the data warehouse or data lake and lake house. Uh, and we're doing lots of projects in Surfalytics. By the way, you can join and do projects uh, with us. For example, just today we did the project on BigQuery. Yesterday we had the projects on DuckDB. We last couple of weeks, we did projects on Redshift serverless, and we learned about the difference between serverless and non-serverless. We also in pipeline many projects related to Azure data stack and um, Databricks, uh, Snowflake. We Snowflake probably the most popular with DBT, but the, the goal here that we practice a lot. We practice a lot with hands-on. We're trying to tailor it to the real world situations. We're going through discussions, what, for example, you can expect from interview, how it actually work. We're trying to move away from traditional tutorial where you just need copy paste the code, run the command and 20 minutes you're done with zero knowledge. So we actually want to understand why. Why are we using this particular technology? What's the pros and cons? For example, then today we had the project on BigQuery. We talk a lot about the difference between Redshift, BigQuery and Snowflake and why some company using BigQuery versus Snowflake and so on and so on. So you, you need the context. Context is important. So, okay, let's let's look here. So assuming we building the data warehouse or data warehouse already there. And I covered this also in the model one. Then I talk the first free lesson I talk about, okay, imagine the business working. And it, there are lots of business process. Uh, each business process generates a bunch of data and we need to store this data uh, for analysis. And usually we store it, uh, consolidate in data platform, data warehouse, data lake, lake house, like, or just a database, doesn't matter. The idea that we have a bunch of different sources, all those sources, they actually mimic the business process. So whatever business process running, this could be supply chain, e-commerce, customer service, um, like anything, just name any business process, any department, they have some systems and application that generates the data. You need this data to track the performance of your business, of particular team, department, product, and so on and so on. Let's look what we have here. Assuming here we might have, uh, okay, traditional backend database, OLTP, and my next lesson about DuckDB, I actually will cover uh, in detail, what is OLTP versus OLAP and what kind of OLAP exists like ROLAP and MOLAP. Uh, so the next lesson definitely will help you better understand this. So with traditional backend databases with transactions, for example, with the e-commerce website running like my example in model one, and it generates a bunch of data. And then we load this data with ETL tools um, in the batch into data warehouse. So this could be different APIs, for example, Salesforce, Google Analytics, Facebook ads, uh, AdWords, pretty any service out there, they have API endpoint for you to consolidate. So that's why it's important to know the couple couple patterns, how you can extract and load the data. Uh, often it could be just log files. It even could be SFTP or just the external systems and applications that generate the data and save them. For example, in case of AWS, it says three buckets. Um, for example, Cloudflare. Cloudflare is the very popular product. It's kind of like firewall shield for organizations to protect them from 
threats from DDoS attacks and so on and so on. And it generates a bunch of data. So obviously it won't store the data forever, the customer data. That's why the customers have the options to uh, sync this data with their S3 bucket, right? The Cloudflare can write the logs, write to an S3, and then you can consume this, right? And there are other systems that can do a very similar way. For the, especially for the product analytics, there are a bunch of uh, systems like Segment, Amplitude, they also have the options to give you the data. But we can slice and dice everything and group by different use cases. There is the product use case, there is marketing use cases, there is the financial, sales, and so on and so on. That's why I also always encourage everyone to go through domain knowledge and learn about different domains, the key metrics, and because anyway, to be the good in what you do to help because our primary goal to help the business so obviously you need to understand the business process high level you need to know what kind of metrics uh, we want to track what's the impact of the metrics and then you need to understand okay if you have this kind of metrics for example for SaaS business with subscription usually it's a annual recurring revenue how to calculate this why it's important and so on and so on and there are some cases could be just the streaming uh, usually streaming is harder with data warehouse, but works fine with lake house and um, data lakes. Uh, some data warehouse, like for example, Snowflake recently started supporting dynamic tables with streaming, but there are also use case for the batch. And there is one more use case I'm adding here uh, that sometimes backend application, so application can have the backend non-traditional SQL server or non-traditional SQL relation database, but instead uh, they they decide to use NoSQL database. And a very popular MongoDB or document database can serve as a backend for mobile applications, even for e-commerce websites, for example, Amazon. Amazon used to work on uh, Oracle uh, and they had some outgage in the past related to, so if I will type Amazon Oracle out, outage um, prime day. And we, we see that uh, Amazon move Oracle database software, main reason for outage in the biggest warehouse on Prime Day. So Oracle, the same OLTP database that was backend of Amazon website in the past, and it was the biggest Oracle implementation in the world. And they, they had the project that called Rolling Stone that actually I was the part of this project in 2016. And we work on get rid from the Oracle and migrate everything to AWS. It was applicable for analytics workloads for because data warehouse was also running on Oracle. So we basically switched from Oracle to Redshift for analytics purpose. Uh, big data sets were switched to uh, Elastic Map Reduce, Hadoop Manage Hadoop and Spark. And uh, also the backend was switched from relational database to NoSQL database DynamoDB. And also we can check in other news, Amazon, Amazon Migrate, uh, from Oracle to DynamoDB. Yeah, um, maybe there is no easy find to find the news about this. But anyway, so right now the backend of Amazon is actually running on DynamoDBs in other cloud offering from AWS, and this is no SQL database. And we will try this in the future. It's on the model five. We we're planning to go deep dive into cloud computing for we'll learn cloud computing fundamentals for Azure, AWS, and GCP. But for now, we're just focusing on different parts of ecosystems and trying to understand their role. So, and this is the case that if assuming we have the mobile application and the mobile applications running on um, backend uh, MongoDB. So recently, I had one example. I work for the company and they have their mobile applications. The mobile applications was connecting to relational database and the face performance issue and also uh, the, they had cost concerns. So the solution was to switch uh, from Azure SQL to Azure Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is the managed NoSQL database from Azure and they improve performance a lot and they drop the cost a lot. One of the benefits, uh, because you can partition, uh, so every, we'll talk more about what is um, document database, but the idea that uh, it, it has the documents, right? So 
what in traditional relational database you have the tables and table has the rows. So, but representations of rows uh, in um, NoSQL database, like in document database, it's one document. It's a JSON document and they can have different structure. They can have nested elements and also you can partition, for example, by user ID. If you have mobile application and the users using mobile application, that as soon as they open mobile applications, they can get very fast their data because it will filtering by their user ID. But here are the idea. So if you work in the data field as a data analyst, data engineer, analyst engineer, the only thing you should be care how to extract the data from backend, da backend database. It could be relational, it could be non-relational. So there is the pattern. So you only care about the pattern and the tools. Very rare cases, you actually need to go and connect the backend database. It probably won't be production, it will be the replica. And then you can query this, for example, if you have some dashboards or some metrics that not match, uh, with uh, backend systems, then you need to query and see what's happening. Also, you can query this to pull some sample data to see what's the structure of the data and prepare prepare landing tables in your uh, data platform, data warehouse, data lake. So just one more time, you as a data person who work with the data, you don't need to directly work with um, uh, those kinds of systems uh, like NoSQL but you might need to query this data and extract data from this. And where rare use case, you can, you can run ad hoc queries. Uh, the Seattle, Seattle data guy wrote nice uh, post about MongoDB uh, that actually many companies trying to use their MongoDB, it's probably early stage startups, they're trying to use MongoDB as their data warehouse for analytics purpose, and it might work in some extensions, but long term is very bad. So it's it's like bad choices. It's not good. And for example, it has even MongoDB has connector to BI that you might sound. Oh, it says BI connector. Let's hook our Power BI in Tableau and build our our data data warehouse on top of MongoDB replica. Uh, in another downside of this, obviously, you can, for example, in my case, right, if it's backend, we can hook the BI tool here and connect a NoSQL database and even report on, for example, daily active users, number of users, number of transactions, different features. But how we will add here the information about Google Analytics, about marketing performance, supply chain, or anything other that's important, sales data, because it sits in the different systems. That's why even don't try. Don't try to build any kind of analytic solution on top of your NoSQL databases. Okay, we covered this topic. We continue our course about um, MongoDB. So I, I had some break, <laughs> I even have got the haircut. Anyway, and while I was away and I took the break, I actually revisited my materials for the MongoDB and I did a lot of changes. And now we're going through my repo and then we actually will start to execute command. Um, what we I have in the repo. So the same repo for the course and we in model two getting started with databases and lesson six NoSQL databases MongoDB. So in here I have a readme file that included everything what we want to cover. So first of all MongoDB like 101. So we know that there are two types of databases. Uh, there is relational database and document database. Relational database database it's clear like right? you're using the SQL. You can query it, you can store the data in tables, you know, the tables can be joined to each other, right? And so on and so on. And you probably already practice a lot. If not, I really encourage you to practice uh, SQL every day. SQL, SQL doesn't matter every day because this is one of the most important skill nowadays for working with data. It doesn't really matter what kind of database you have, like SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, Snowflake, Red, it doesn't matter. The SQL, usually the same. The only difference is the date functions or some other functionality, but you need to understand the core and you should be able to, to solve um, any task you, you get at work, right? If you need any data, you pull it from the database and then you can analyze it. You can analyze in spreadsheet, you can analyze with Python, you can analyze with BI tools. Well, there are many, many different ways what you can do with the data. 
But the document date database is one of the NoSQL database and we cover different types of NoSQL database. So document database is quite popular and it's data storing, it means the data storing in document and each document is independent and they may have different schema, right? In traditional relational database, if we have the table, a table have five columns, we really strict on the schema. So the document database doesn't really care for the schema and each document might have different schema even if they part of the same collection by the way collection in document database is the same as a table in relational database so mongodb is a document database with the scal scalability and flexibility that you want uh, with querying and indexing that you need uh, it's very popular in uh, uh, full stack web applications or different kind of could be just backend applications and we already talk about use cases for NoSQL database so it should be clear for you as a data person you don't need to learn a lot how to uh, manage how to deploy MongoDB in production and another thing you should to learn that you shouldn't use MongoDB as your analytical solutions right it's better to use any other relational database just because uh, it is uh, the right way to build your analytic solution. Um, there are many different full stack frameworks that I want to cover. Um, and they have different purposes, dif different uh, setup. And for example, the mean stack, right? It means by the first letters, it uses MongoDB as a database, Express.js as a backend framework, Angular front end framework, Node.js runtime environment and the use case single page application there is Marin stack it's also using mongodb right the use case uh, instead of um, angular it uses react so it's dynamic web applications with complex uis there is maven stack also using mongodb uh, but it's using vue.js front-end framework progressive web applications and probably some people who work in as a front-end engineers uh, they learn this thing and they learn how to build those kind of applications. So if you backend engineer, then you probably know how to deploy MongoDB and why you should use the MongoDB versus a relational database. Or maybe you need to use the graph database or any other NoSQL database. There is LampStack. So it's used very different. You see there is JamStack. Uh, it's using JavaScript as a front end. There is Django and React. It's Django is a backend uh, framework for Python React is front end library. Uh, there is Ruby on Rails and React to View. There is Spring Boat. There is Serverless Stack. So the Serverless Stack is actually quite popular, especially nowadays. Then public cloud, like every company, most of the companies running on the public cloud. So it means uh, they're very comfortable to go with, uh, for example, database like DynamoDB. So instead of MongoDB, right, they're going with DynamoDB, or you can go with Managed versus version of mongodb atlas that we'll talk so now we actually will use today different kind of mongodb uh, there is cosmos db from asia and so on uh, and the use case application is scalability minimal maintenance and event driven workflows we already talk about migrations of amazon from oracle to dynamodb and yeah the serverless applications really give lots of flexibility but sometimes it could be even more expensive than running your own uh, application in your own premise your own data center so now let's talk about the key elements for mongodb so mongodb is structured to store data in a flexible document oriented format and there are a breakdown of companies so the top level uh, is the mongodb or mongodb database so as a, any other database you mongodb break by databases uh, it's already have some systems database and you can create your own new databases inside database you can find collections so collections is a group of documents within a database similar to table and relation database and we'll work today a lot with collections we'll query collections we'll uh, we'll use the sample data available for us we also will create the new database and um, insert some documents so the documents is like rows in the traditional tables. As soon as you understand the difference between relational and document database, it, it's become very clear how to work with such uh, databases. The document is the basic unit of data in MongoDB. It's represented in JSON-like format called BSON, binary JSON. And we'll talk more about this. So the field, a key value pair with a document similar to column in a relation database. BSON binary JSON, so MongoDB use BSON format to store 
data, which supports a broader range of data types. Index, it's the same as a traditional database or data warehouse. You have indexes that can improve the performance, the reading uh, of your data. A replica set, um, a group of MongoDB servers we actually will look because we will use Atlas. So it's managed versus version of MongoDB. And as soon as you start it, you already have uh, multiple uh, servers. They like replicate each other. And it's uh, built for fault tolerance and provide redundancy. If one replica is go away, we instant uh, another one available. So it makes it more durable. And sharding, 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 it's very popular technique, especially for backend databases. So it's horizontal scaling mechanism, allowing data to be distributed across multiple servers, shards. Each shard holds a subset of data, enabling the database to handle large data sets and high query loads efficiency. So now we want to talk about JSON. What is JSON? Um, if you know work with JSON, we actually already talk uh, in the model one about different data types and we talk what is JSON. So just a reminder. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's lightweight data interchange format, easy for humans to read and write. Because alternative to JSON is XML. It was very popular in the past and nowadays uh, I don't really see any XML and we, we especially in the data, we work a lot with JSONs. And usually we work with JSON, then we extract the data from APIs. But in the backend application, for example, or between different services, the data usually sent back and forth in the JSON format. This is just example of the JSON. You see it's key, key value pairs. It means it's the key and it's the value. If you work in the Python, it's very similar to dictionary, right? You have the key and value. The JSON object is main building block of JSON. So this is just example, right? Uh, and it could consist from many different uh, blocks. This is another example of JSON block. There is also JavaScript object. is the complex data structure in JavaScript that allows you to store collection of data as key value pairs. And this is example. You see the difference? It looks like JSON, but it, even here it's highlighted like it's uh, because I use the markdown as a JSON and it's highlighted as the error JSON because it's not the JSON. It's JavaScript object and you can notice that it doesn't have the quotes uh, around the keywords. Uh, there is also binary JSON. And if you go inside, uh, because MongoDB is storing data in BSON, and this is how it's actually storing. And those numbers, they often represent the data type because there are different data types allowed to store in JSON. It could be array, it could be string, could be number. So this uh, represents the, the type. And there are different number represent, represents different things. There is also extended JSON, and the extended extended JSON uh, allows us to use work with the JSONs. But for example, for our value, we can wrap it in the function. For example, I, I, I saw data or some other functions that will make sure that we will get the right format before we will insert into our application or send it. So now we can move to installations of MongoDB. So with MongoDB, we have multiple options for installation. We can go simply with MongoDB Community Edition. And I'm talking, I'm using macOS. So that's why I'm using Brew to install different applications. I can just go Brew, tap MongoDB Brew. I can install the Community Edition and then I can start it. So this will running locally, uh, the MongoDB on my machine. It's the same if, if we will go and install the Postgres. And this is, for example, the Postgres that we installed from the last lesson on model two is still available on my my machine and like Postgres SQL still running. I probably don't need, I can turn on, turn off it. Um, then there is uh, the managed version I mentioned many times, Atlas. So we can install CLI tool to connect external, external one. So let's go and see what we have. So first of all, if you decide to create the Mongo, MongoDB Atlas, so we can go here to official website. Here you can get the free uh, MongoDB. So as soon as you sign up here, even you can use your Google account, you can sign up and you get free version of MongoDB. 
you don't really need it for a long time because uh, this is not something you, you want to invest your time. But just get the general understanding how things works. And especially if your company using NoSQL database, then you have better understanding how it's storing and how you can query the data. So th this is um, Atlas. So, and with the clusters, I have one cluster already. So I can create another clusters and there are options. Uh, I can use, um, um, I already using, uh, I think M0. This is the free version. And now I have options using the serverless. Then I'm going to pay only for data scanning or I can choose the different clusters. I can choose uh, what provider I'm interested in, but doesn't really matter. And then I can go and create deployment. When you create it for the first time, you can choose M0 and this is the free one. And this is exactly what I have here. So I have um, cl this cluster and we already can see that I have multiple replica sets. I have cluster that's my primary for the write operations and I have secondary for read. If my primary goes down, the secondary will take over. Um, we can see some metrics here. Um, when we create our cluster, we will create the user. You can save the user in the password. Uh, there are some metrics I don't have for my. Uh, with some charts. I think it's new service. Um, dashboard for multi chart and just a few clicks. I, I didn't use it, so I don't know what is it. We can, we can give a try. But what do you need to do? You need to create the cluster uh, Atlas, the, the cheap one. Why you want to do this? Because if we're going to, because this has the sample data and this sample data we can use for many purposes. For example, you can build the end-to-end -end project, your data engineering project, analytics projects. Uh, if you have data storing available in JSON format in MongoDB, your goal is a data analyst or data engineer to extract this data and load into data warehouse. It could be Postgres, it could be Snowflake, could be BigQuery, anything. You need to use the tools that can extract this data flat on the JSON and uh, to make it store in the table. And then you can start do some analysis. For example, you can use dbt to transform your data. You can just use the play in SQL and then you can connect BI tool, you build couple dashboard. This is very good example, very good projects, and you can learn a lot. And this is will cover end to end and you will work with NoSQL database. So what we have here, um, it's still trying to create the charts, loading, almost, almost there. Okay. We can look to the sample dashboard uh, and you can see it even have uh, nice dashboards and this is really fit to our previous lesson Then we talk about data visualization for the database and you can see how the vendors in our example MongoDB already provide you some visual tools that you can visualize your data right here and don't need to do anything. So you can think about this BI tool. I don't know what they use here. But it's nice. It's another thing that you can talk over your interview that you can directly create the business dashboards. You see, for example, this is the product dashboards and you might care about daily active users, uh, user events fired and so on and so on. And because this is the product dashboards and this is your could be backend of your product, usually MongoDB or this backend database doesn't have full information. It doesn't have, for example, marketing information, marketing expenses. It doesn't have your sales information. It's only give you the product information. But this dashboard probably could be also serve you in real time. That might be very valuable, especially then you release the new mobile versions or firmware. Uh, well, basically a release new version, you can track how users uh, react. This, this, for example, chart for the version use, right? And we can see majority on the last one, but some still not. Operation system, so a good breakdown. And we can build our own uh, charts and dashboards here. And we go back to data services. So I'm going back to, to here. And uh, yeah, if you want to install, you can install it. 
Um, we definitely need to install uh, MongoDB Atlas, the CLI, CLI, to be able to start the shell. So the, the MongoDB itself consists from the shell and MongoDB server. So server keeps the data and everything happening in the server and shell we're using to connect and operate on our MongoDB server. So we will do this later. And also I want to highlight that I have the Docker Compose. So if you want to practice a bit of the Docker and Docker Compose, then you can try to read what we have here. And in Docker Compose, I using, if you, if you didn't work with Docker, please go to the model zero. Then we talk about how to set up IDE, CLI, and how to work with the Docker and how to create your GitHub account where you can submit all the work you're doing while you're learning. So it consists from free uh, images and we use the vendor images or is a Mongo image, right? Uh, with the MongoDB server, there is Mongo Express, uh, this web UI and there is Mongo client. So those are three things and I covering it, what each of them means and why we're using here in the readme document. So the MongoDB service, this actual MongoDB database, right? And it's configuring to run on the port 27017. It's default MongoDB port. Mongo Express service is lightweight web-based admin interface called Mongo Express. And Mongo Client service is uh, the Docker Compose file. It's additional container designed to provide access to MongoDB shell. Because I tried to use just those two, I wasn't able to connect. And then I adding the MongoDB client as an individual container, and then I can uh, connect this this uh, client, and from this client I can execute the shell and working with my database. So to to and we'll run this as well. So what we now want to do, let's first trying to start my Docker Compose, basically create the local local MongoDB server, running it in uh, in container. So we can see where I'm now. And we also will practice a common line interface. So I'm on the right. So then I need to go to uh, model two, NoSQL database, MongoDB. We can see what we have here. We have Docker Compose. And uh, it means we can run Docker Compose up. It's starting MongoDB. It's uh, Mongo Express and Mongo Client. So th the next step, we can check uh, the logs. It's another command that can show us uh, the logs. For example, if anything not working, we can pull the logs from container and see why it fails to start. And finally, we can launch the shell. So I can use command K to clean it and we are already in the shell. I can see, maybe I can try the version. I have the MongoDB version, so it's the same as a community edition because uh, in my Docker uh, Compose, I showed I used the latest MongoDB, so it will be always the same as, uh, as available from MongoDB. And basically, it's used the same community edition. Okay, uh, what we can do, uh, if we can do use um, uh, command to I don't know, do we have uh, this? Will this command work or not? Uh, no. And for this one, yeah, this is my little helper. And um, I forgot the command to show the database. And I will quickly ask the chat GPT. Yeah, there is, um, yeah, there's a small command. So we have three databases here and we want to create the new one. Uh, the command use my DB. So it will create. Yeah. And now if I will say, show me databases, uh, I also need to, as soon as I start using it, I need to insert something. So I need to create collection and uh, I will create my collection and I will insert multiple objects into it. So when every record has their own object ID, 
And now we can uh, use the find command. It's, it's the same as a query from the data. So the, this is example what we have. Um, or we can use the uh, pass exactly like filter, the same as a where condition, and we return one one. Uh, return just one ro record or multiple records based on the requirements. And we can see, yeah, now I have my database and it has a couple objects. So I don't need anything um, else here from my Docker Compose. And the next step will switch to uh, Atlas CLI. Also, before doing so, I want to show you a couple clients. One of them is called Robo3T. Uh, and I'm not sure is it um, free or not. And another one calls uh, MongoDB Express. You can download this. Oh, not Express, sorry, Compass, MongoDB Compass. Uh, and you can see, you can download it, a use. And I even run one. And uh, where is my Compass? Yeah, this is the Compass. It's, it is connecting to my Docker Compose. And I can show you edit connection. The same what we learned with relation database. You have the host, you have the user and the password. And user and the password available in the Docker Compose file. So, and that's it. And we can connect and query. And this is my Atlas one. So the one that I create in the browser. We can connect it and we can see it has sample data and it has uh, multiple collections. And today we'll work with collection features and we can see storage size. Uh, that's Those collections could serve well for you to actually doing some transformations and build some ETL uh, with NoSQL uh, source. And imagine you can, for example, if we talk about movies, right? Um, there is another popular data, data set exists like IMDb movies, and it could be a really nice project to combine IMDb and uh, NoSQL MongoDB and maybe just see overlap. So, and we can see this is each document. So we can expand. This is the kind of the JSON format. We can also look into this format, this like real JSON. And we also can do as a table that is quite convenient. Like uh, we, we couldn't do this in, uh, in the Mongo shell CLI. So, and here we can uh, create the query. For example, we can find something um, and, but, and we also can do some aggregations command. We can look to the schema. We can check the indexes for our collection. Uh, even some, we can create some rules for validations, but we're gonna use the terminal and we're gonna explore different commands. So I'm gonna go in back and here, So after you install the Atlas CLI, you need to log in. So by running this command, uh, it will log in. And I already authenticated and I can see my cluster list. This is only one cluster I'm running. And uh, also to to connect um, to my Atlas database, we need to install Mongo shell. So this is the command. And obviously for Windows, there is another set of commands, but you should achieve the same result, or you can just use the Compass, or if you don't like Compass, you can use Robo3T. It has really nice interface, very similar to traditional SQL clients that you can just copy paste the query and execute. So here, we can uh, connect and this is my user so I can connect to my cluster also if we're going to here so and uh, my clusters 
I can go to the cluster and click connect. And here we have the options that we can use for connection. Compass shell, MongoDB VS Code plugin, Atlas SQL. You can see we even can use the SQL commands to work with our MongoDB that can simplify our, our life. And maybe there is the Python options to, to leverage the SQL. And um, we can create these and then we can download the driver. They have uh, drivers for Power BI and Tableau. We have GDBC or DBC. We can use database. And this is the connection string, string that we can use uh, for connector. If um, I never explored this option, but probably uh, you can use it for GDBC. We can trying to connect from SQL client to MongoDB, just using the MongoDB GDBC driver. This is the port. And uh, then we can have the list of all collections and we can write the SQL queries. What a nice configuration. But here, for if we talk about shell, this is actually what we need to do, right? We're installing this and we can start to work. In other options uh, for connections, our cloud version, uh, we can use the compass we tried. We can also use plugin for VS Code and we can uh, explore our data right from VS Code. Okay, going back to VS Code. Or oh, not VS Code, but uh, my commands. So, so I need to type the, my password and you, you get your password as soon as you create the cloud database. Uh, let me type uh, my password. And I'm connecting. Yeah, this is a uh, Mongo shell and I'm connecting to the primary uh, node. Now we can uh, check some commands. We can check the versions, right? At seven, it means community is higher with the help command that give us different commands and what they're doing. We can check the databases uh, and their size. Uh, we can choose that we want to use the database sample and we can see the collections that it has. And we will work today with Fitters collection. So, and let's start from querying our collections. This is a sample of five documents. Um, in the pretty format, it means you see it has some highlight. We can try the same without pretty. Um, I don't know the difference pretty and non pretty looks like very similar. Yeah, there is no difference for this one. But you can see we have the feeder, location data, and coordinates for the feeder. Uh, if you want to just, uh, and it's basically select uh, star from theaters uh, limit five. If we want without limitations, we can use this command. Um, we can also add condition, the same as a where condition, and find just. Just one feature. Um, I don't know. I don't have this feature. Um, we can try. We can try to choose the feature eight. Yeah, and find the, the single feature. Uh, there are same idea like in where condition and SQL. We have and or greater than less equal not null and so on in sort of a couple of operators. There is example of or operator. Uh, there is example of and operator. Then we combine couple uh, condition and there is example of in operator. Um, the next thing, because if we consider 
MongoDB is a backend database. The, one of the primary goals is to insert the data. And it could be insert, usually it's insert programmatically for different APIs and services. It, we don't usually need to insert manually, but we can see uh, how it works. And this is, uh, we can insert one document and we can insert multiple documents. And you see for every inserted document, we're getting the object ID. So it also has the same as SQL. It has sort, limit. Um, I don't, don't, I'm not sure that SQL have skip, uh, but this is examples of sorting by C getting order. Uh, we can uh, limit, we already tried, and we can skip the first two results. So moving forward, there is also update operation. We can find the document. It works like because every document should have like unique ID, unique key. We can find this and we can do set. Uh, for example, we can set the key and we can update the value. Uh, and the same for we can do like update multiple documents. Uh, we can also do deletion, find the document and delete it or we can delete many documents based on condition. Uh, we can also use aggregation. And for example, in charts, what we saw, right? Some kind of aggregation data, it's using the aggregation feature of MongoDB. For example, we can find uh, theaters in state California. So, and it's return, um, Peterson State, California. Here, we basically we just run return all theaters without any aggregations. Here, we can do aggregation, right? We can basically number of theaters. And we can see uh, based on state, we have number of theaters. We can also sort result and do many different things. Uh, moving forward, aggregate. There is another example. We can create the custom field and aggregate. So the feature ID, city, and full address. So in, in our case, we can continue the address for every theater. We also can do, and MongoDB has really nice features for working with geolocation data. And because in our examples, our theaters, they, they have their uh, long, longitude and latitude. So we can leverage this data. And for example, this query uh, returns us all theaters that will be in 5,000. So in 5,000 uh, from this point. And it will show us also distance uh, from this point. Uh, next topic I want to cover quickly is MongoDB indexes. So the indexes, the primary reason for this is uh, help you with performance. So the very common explanation of indexes, imagine you, you open the book and it has uh, outline, right? And you have the topic and the page, or if you go to library, uh, there is could be outer sorted by first letter, and then you can find the outer A, and then you can see all books for outers that the first letter is A. So the index is the same. They help you, the help database to quickly find and retrieve the data without scanning all the data, because scanning all the data is expensive. The same happening in analytics and data warehouse. And common question on interview about the indexes. So the MongoDB indexes, there are different types. This could be a single field index, right? We can create the index. There is could be compound index if you have multiple fields. Of every index, it depends on the query pattern. For different use cases, you should use the different kind of indexes. For example, if we talk about mobile applications, then you have customer ID, and the customer ID has the, some metrics related to associated with this customer. Obviously, the collection should be uh, indexed by customer ID but there could be many different use cases. Um, 
maybe for some applications, right, based on like uh, maps and geolocations, it should be indexed by geolocation coordinates. For example, you open application, you want to see all restaurants near you. So that's why you it doesn't matter uh, you doesn't matter to index by restaurant. It's it's matter to index by location of restaurant. So compounding is we have the text index useful for full text search with string fields, geospatial index, unique index, wildcard indexes. So and we can always see indexes if our collection have the index and what are they. So here we can see uh, we have uh, ID. And uh, the second index, we also buy location. And this is a good example that I just mentioned about location data. We can also drop in the index. So there is additional feature uh, from MongoDB. If you need dump data on your local machine, you can install Mongo Expert. And then you can uh, export like collection or query and save in output. And then finally, since we're working all the data, and as I mentioned, our primary goal it's extract data from NoSQL database. And I want to talk about tools that are available for this operation. There is low-code applications or no-code applications. There is the Fivetran and Matillion. So this MongoDB connector and Fivetran, but be aware, Fivetran will gonna charge you by number of rows. So if you have really large data, that could be, might be very expensive. Uh, then, um, Matillion, ETL, uh, Dynamo, or oh, Dynamo, MongoDB. It has example of the same, right? And it's using some kind of MongoDB API that wrap, yeah, it's using REST API. It's wrap into nice connector in Matillion that you can use and drag and drop and build. So yeah, I need to update here the link. I will fix it. There is also open source. Airbyte, Miltana is a, two of the most popular. They have connectors. They're probably all using the same underlying technology. And um, you can work. It means you can, if you deploy them, you can work for free. Uh, there is example straightforward with Python. So you can use PyMongo. And this example, you can connect the MongoDB uh, database and choose the collection. You can extract the data. You can do some kind of transformation with data and, for example, push it into their database. Or, and there is one more example with Airflow. Airflow is common orchestration framework. And, for example, you can just schedule the job inside Airflow that will connect the MongoDB and downloading everything for you, transforming and pushing into, into the final data. That's it about MongoDB. So you don't need to go deep in the MongoDB, but now you, you learn about one of the most popular document uh, NoSQL database that might be helpful for you, especially if organizations using any kind of document database in the backend. So now you know how it works. And now you also know how you can extract the data from these uh, and how you can work and query the data. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>